Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. We've been talking about the goodness of God for a number of weeks now. We're kind of on the downhill slide of finishing up uh, the 23rd Psalm, and we come to verse number five. How many of you have a copy of the Word of God? Just hold it up good and high, whether it's a tablet or a phone or whatever it is. Just kind of wave it at the devil. You know, he hates that book. He hates that book. Amen. All right. Uh, Verse 5 is an incredible verse. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Uh, COVID-19 has really taken its toll on our country. Uh, We have had our government shut churches down and declared them to be non-essential. I've got news, friends. The church is the most essential element on this uh, planet today. And you uh, have to understand that the soul is a lot more important than the body. This old body is like a tent and it's wearing out and it's going to lay down one of these days, but we're going to live forever. And the soul needs nourishment and it needs encouragement. So don't tell me uh, that we are not essential. We now have gone through a major test in our culture and uh, using fear as a weapon, uh, this test has revealed that the government can pretty much dictate uh, whether or not the church can get together or do get together. I heard a local pastor just uh, the last couple of days say that the next test won't be whether or not we can get together, but who we worship when we do get together and what we worship. Three pastors in Canada right now uh, have uh, been incarcerated because they uh, preached a portion of the word of God that the government does not agree with. Uh, So, you know, it's, it's headed our way and we're in a battle. We're in a battle, and uh, I'm not sure it's going to get any better anytime soon, but in the midst of that propagation of fear, we have watched substance uh, substance abuse climb to all-time highs in this country. Uh, We have watched domestic violence invade homes all over America at incredible rates. One of the things that I and most disturbed about is what the isolation has done to many of the people that find themselves in our nursing homes and in our assisted living centers. When the isolation has killed more and more people than most folks realize the detrimental effect that it has had. Many of you have come today either by way of the internet or television or here in this congregation this morning, you are just worn out. You're just worn down. And you're wondering, how much more am I going to be able to take? Uh, And you're asking yourself the question, how do I find the goodness of God in the midst of what I am facing? How do we find the goodness of God when we are suffering at the hands of uh, what many call, and I'll use their term, as a pandemic. But you're facing battles. When you do face battles, how does the goodness of God help you in that process? Today, I think that there are three major pictures that jump out to us in verse 5 And in reading verse 5, I'm going to really break it down today, just word for word, and just give us uh, about four different insights concerning the verse. Uh, Insight number one, I want to talk to you about the description of this banquet, uh, descriptions of this table, if you will. And then I want to talk about the despicables that will be present at the banquet. I want to give you the design for the banquet. And then I'm going to finish up with the uh, delicacies 
that we're going to enjoy or do enjoy uh, during the banquet. So let's just dig in. You got your word and uh, Psalm 23 verse 5. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Uh, now what's the description uh, concerning this banquet, if you will? Now, when he says, thou preparest a table, he's talking, of course, about the host of the banquet or the person who is the host at the banquet. And he's talking about God himself. Can you imagine if yesterday morning when you uh, woke up that you received an invitation from God to a major festival or this big banquet? Can you you imagine, I, I bet some of you women, you look at your husband, you say, I, I got to go to the mall. I got to get me a dress for that banquet. And, and some of you men say, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you. I, I need a new tie. Mine's got food all over it, and I want a new tie to wear at the banquet. And I doubt very seriously if you would have slept very good last night in anticipation that you were going to a banquet that God was preparing for you. Oh, you get up on Sunday morning and you jump in that shower. And you put on the new clothes that you got and sprinkle a little flu-flu on and out the door you'd go just with great anticipation that God had invited you to this banquet. Well, notice something else with me. Not only the person at the band, but at the preparation. Thou preparest a table before me. You understand something that this was not some fly by night idea. It was not something on the spur of the moment. It's not something that God had just come up with, but he has thought about it and he has gotten ready for it and he's made major preparations for the banquet that he has invited you to. Notice he says, thou preparest a table. It's the Hebrew word shukan. It's a powerful word. It, it, it really translates better as banquet than it does a table. Yesterday, Kathy and I uh, went out to eat with my brother and sister-in-law and we got to the restaurant about 4.30. I let them out at the door and I drove to my parking spot over there. And, and I looked and on the left-hand side of the restaurant, they had a, 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 a to-go orders and people were picking it up. And I, I looked out, Matthew, and somebody had brought a card table and a couple of folding chairs and set them out beside their car and they were eating the order that they had put in. And I'm thinking about my message this morning and I, I'm thinking about Shukan. And it's not a, let, let me just tell you, this table is not a card table with folding chairs. It's a table that is set for the king. It's the king's table. It's about a hundred feet long and, and it would set about a hundred people at that table. I'm telling you, he prepared a king's feast at that table. It's the same word too, by the way, that is used as the table that holds the shoe bread inside the temple. It's a holy time. It's a sacred banquet. And God's made preparations for you uh, to be there. What a special time that God has set aside that he has invited us to. Now notice what else he says here, how personal it is. Thou preparest a table for me. <laughs> oh my, isn't, isn't that a powerful thing? To know that God has invited you to a banquet and you are the guest of honor. You are the big cheese and there's nobody there but you and the king. That makes you somebody. And then he says this. I want it to be a public affair. I don't want it to be some private uh, affair when all of the muckety mucks are there and, and they are isolated and, and they were quarantined so that nobody else. I want to make it a public affair. In other words, he says here, thou preparest a table uh, for me 
in the presence of mine enemies. Now, they're not a participant at the banquet. They're on the outside looking in, but it's a public thing that God is doing. Now, notice the place, if you will. The place of the banquet is really significant. God says, uh, I'm inviting you to this banquet, not just when things are going good. Did you hear the testimonies a few minutes ago? Not just when things are going good. I'm inviting you to a banquet in the middle of the battle. It's on the battlefield, if you will. Now, the second observation that I want to make to you are the despicables who are there at the banquet. Now, you and I, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. This is an entirely different sermon altogether. But you and I face three enemies in this life. Number one, we face an external enemy. It's called the world. The world out there wants to squeeze you into its mold. The world out there wants you to conform to its uh, image. It's everything that is in opposition to God. Let me just say something to you for a minute. Uh, don't you think for one minute that what we're going through in this country is purely political. That's a bunch of hogwash. What we're really going through is one of the most major spiritual battles this country has ever gone through and the world is in opposition to everything that is of God. If you have suffered some bias it's the world. If you've suffered from prejudice, it's the world. If you have suffered racism, it is the world that has come against you. If you've been overlooked for a particular promotion because of your agenda, that is the world around you. Then we face the infernal enemy. The infernal enemy. Uh, that's the devil himself. Uh, you you, you, you got to understand the devil wants to defeat you. He is our enemy. As a matter of fact, the word of God says that he ultimately wants to kill you. But the fact of the matter is, folks, uh, the devil doesn't think much of you. Uh, you, you but I'll tell you what he does. <laughs> he hates God and he hates everything about God. And the thing that he knows is that he can't do anything against God so he does the very thing that you and I have experienced in our own life. And he says, you know, I can't get to him, but I can get to his kids and I can get to his grandkids. And if I can hurt his children, if I can hurt his grandchildren, then I can somehow hurt the heart of God. Now you want to you wanna, you wanna hurt me, you go after one of my kids, right? You go after one of my grandkids and you can get to me in that fashion. He's an infernal enemy. But now listen to this. I believe the biggest enemy that you and I face, and the older I get, the more convinced I am of it, is our internal enemy. That's the flesh. My beautiful, brilliant, gifted, 21-year-old grandson looked at me in his dying days and he said, Papa, I just want to know why I do what I do. He's fighting that flesh. We, we all have good intentions. We, we all want to please God. I'm, I'm going to live holy. I, I'm going to live righteous. I'm going to do right. I, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I, I'm going to be the person God wants me to be. And we have these great intentions that we will be the person God intends for us to be. But in the next breath, we do just the opposite. Paul had that problem in Romans chapter 7, if you want to read about it. He also said, I know the good that I ought to do. I, I know what I'm supposed to be like. I, I know how I'm supposed to live, but I just do the opposite anyway. And there are all kinds of things out there that the word of God has said, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to do it. And we intend with all of our mind and heart and soul and strength, that's what we're going to do. But that old internal enemy of the flesh comes against us. 
So we got these three enemies. God says, I'll prepare a table before you in their presence. I'll prepare a banquet for you in their presence. But now the design of the banquet is this. Um, The first thing that this banquet is designed for is that God has set it up so that you and I can have fellowship with him. I want to know you. I want you to know me. I want you and I to hang out together. Isn't that what we do when we want to have fellowship with somebody? Don't we pick up the phone or see them at church or run into them? So, hey, let's go get something to eat. Can I get a witness, anybody in the house? It's not about the food. It's about hanging out. It's about spending time with each other. It's getting to know one another. It's having fellowship with one another. So God says, I want to prepare this banquet for you so that you and I can hang out. So you can know me. God says everything's coming against you. I want you to know I care about you. I want you to know I love you. The Bible tells us in the book of Psalm in that fifth chapter and 11th verse, And I'll read from a paraphrase that says, but you'll welcome us with open arms when we run for cover to you. Let the party last all night. Stand guard over our celebration. God says, I know that you're in the throes of the battle in your job. I know that you're about to be swamped with some kind of relationship that's going south on you. I know that you're in the heat Uh, the battle for your health or your sanity. Hang on, we're going to throw a party and so I can encourage you uh, along the way. How many of you have ever seen the movie Braveheart? Mel Gibson, Braveheart. You ever seen that movie? Hang on, let me see you. One of my favorite. I I probably watched that thing a half dozen times. I I, I like all that blood. I like all that shooting and and, and shooting arrows, and, and, and it's just good. Can you see this with me for a minute? Old Mel Gibson, he's got his army on this side of the valley, and there's a bit another big old enemy army on that side of the valley, and somebody gives a signal. Do you remember? And boom, these two armies clash. And man, they're taking hatchets and, and axes and bows and arrows, and, and, and they got, I mean, they're just going at it. And you're in the middle of all of that battle and about that time the commander in chief comes and he snatches you out of the throes of the heat of that battle and he carries you to a hillside on the other side of that valley. Up on top of that hillside, there's this beautiful, gorgeous, white tent that is arrayed with all kinds of furls and flags. Everybody can see it and the commander in chief takes you up to that tent And inside that tent is this amazing banquet table that'll seat a hundred people. Nobody there but the king of the country. They escort you inside. And there is spread out more food than you could ever imagine. There's soul food in there and comfort food in there. The aroma is just overwhelming. Anybody getting hungry about this time? And and, and you're just amazed at the variety of the food that is there. And, and, And you're the guest of honor. Outside the tent, there is a tremendous army that has secured that spot that nobody dare interrupt. Outside the tent, there is a banner hanging. That banner... It's very clear to everybody. That banner reads, I love, and you put your name right there. I love Mike Whitson. And and everybody sees it and the battle just ceases. The battle stops. They stop their fighting and their killing and their pillaging and everybody just looks. You mean the king is having lunch with Mike Whitson, I want you to look at that. Thou preparest a table before me in the heat of the battle, 
in the presence of my enemies. Job 36, 16 says, he is wooing you from the jaws of distress to a spacious place free from restriction. You understand Job is describing exactly Psalm 23, 5. He says it's a spacious place free from restriction to the comfort of your table laden with choice food. In the middle of everything that you're going through, in the midst of every exigency that you are facing, in the center of your world being turned upside down. God says, come over here a minute. Look at this table I've got ready for you. Sit down here. Take a rest. Let me love on you for a minute. Let me show you that I care about you. I want to hang out with you a little while. Oh, but it gets gooder. Not only does he prepare that table in the midst of the battle so that he could hang out with you and have fellowship with you, he wants to flaunt you. He wants to use you as a trophy of his grace. Look what he's doing with Letha in the middle of a brain tumor. She's standing strong for the glory of God. She's a trophy. We don't deserve it. What we do deserve is death and hell. But God, because of his infinite mercy and grace, gives us what we don't deserve so that he could display us and say, look here what I can do with somebody that will just yield their heart and their life to me. Just look. And he displays. Psalm 31, verse 19 says, how abundant are the good things that you have stored up for the, those who fear you that you bestow in the sight of all on those who take refuge in you. Did you notice those two words, stored up? You understand something? God knew what you were going to go through before you ever started going through it. He didn't wait until you arrived in the most difficult time and season of your life to try to figure out what he was going to do. The Bible says, I, I'm going to store it up. I know what they're going to face down the road. I'm going to get it ready for them so that when they get in the midst of it, it'll already be there for them. And when I give it to them, he says, in the sight of all, I'll give it to them. Everybody's going to see, look what God has done for them. How blessed we are. How blessed we are that God loves us, that he cares about us that much. I know you're going through it. God knows you're going through it. So what do you do? You just keep on honoring him. By the way that you act, by the way that you talk, by where you go, by what you do. Keep honoring the Lord. Now, let me talk to you about the delicacies at this table. Uh, what's on the menu? Aren't you amazed today you just put your phone up to some little messed up picture and all of a sudden the menu just pops up right there? Took me forever to learn how to do that. What's on the menu? Can I answer it real easily for you? That book I asked you to hold up a few minutes ago, the menu's right in there. Somebody counted them. I didn't count them, but there's over 5,500 promises that God has laid out in this book designed just for you. And my question is, how many of those promises have you eaten? How many of those promises have you tasted of? How many of those promises have you enjoyed as a delicacy in your life? God designed them just for you. The problem is if you're not reading and studying this book, you don't know what's on the menu. 
Bible says man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That's the menu. And the good part about having the promises of God and the menu that he has set before you, you can have a banquet anywhere you go. As long as you know what the menu is. Why would you go anywhere else to eat when you've got this banquet? The problem is, though, you don't know what the menu is because you haven't spent time reading the Word of God. Matter of fact, you spend more time in social media than you do the Word of God. You spend more time in a newspaper than the Word of God. You spend more time in, a te- in front of a television than you do in the Word of God. In other words, you're spending more time reading and applying stuff that you really don't even believe than you know the truth. How much time do you spend in the Word of God? Well, preacher, I I come to church uh, every week and I I hear you preach and and, and I I spend about an hour here with you every week, preacher. Let's apply that to your physical life for a minute. Suppose you just had one meal every seven days. How long do you think that you would stay physically healthy? And if this is all the word of God that you ever get during a week's period of time, it's no wonder that in the throes of the heat of the battle you get overcome because you don't have the menu. That's where you get your strength for the battle. I just challenge everybody in here, get you a good translation of the word of God that you can understand, that you can figure out, that makes sense to you. And you read that every day of your life and you soak it in and then you get in a small group somewhere where the word of God is being taught and where you can get accountable to others and then find you a life track on Wednesday nights that can meet some of the needs that you're facing in your life and, 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 and make this thing serious about knowing what the menu is that God has for you so that he could prepare a table before you in the presence of your enemies, in the throes of the battle, so he could draw near to you and say, hey, come on, let's hang out. Let's spend some time together. Let me show you that I love you. I was so disturbed the last couple of days. I was taking the word of God and just... uh, trying to help somebody as they are going through a situation. I understand, I understand. I said, no, you, you, you you really don't understand, do you? Hear me a minute, come here, come here, come here a minute. How you view that book will determine the level of victory that you walk in this life. You understand, this is more than a textbook. If you view it as a textbook, you're never going to sit at the banquet table with the Lord in the middle of your battles. So some view it as a history book. And it contains a, a lot of good history. There's, there's a lot of reliable, historical truth in that book, but it's more than a textbook. It's more than a history book. It's God's love letter to you. I spent two years in the military. Highlight of my day was when the mail carrier came by. Can I get a witness from you soldiers in this room? Whew, it'd be a horrible, horrible day, but boy, you just look up and there he is and he says, mail, he called out your name. I'm going to tell you what. When he called out, Sergeant Wetson, I didn't reply back and say, well, just lay it over there on the coffee table. I I don't have time right now to get to it. I'll get to it in a little while. 
They called out my name, dude. I'm telling you, you better not get in my way because I knew what that man was holding. He had a love letter for me from my sweetheart that I couldn't wait to read. <laughs> this is God's love letter. and We just throw it on the coffee table until the next week when we got to pick it up and carry it back with us. This is right now. Oh, but there, there, hey, <laughs> he gives us banquet tables right now. But there's coming a day when there will be a banquet of all banquets. And he's told us about it. I want you to listen in Isaiah chapter 25. Listen, what, listen what's about to happen. I believe it's close. I believe it's near. He's about to say, listen this. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines on this mountain. Now listen, listen. If y'all listen and say amen. amen. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples. Well, what does that mean? I want to tell you what it means, friend. From the time that you take your first breath and throughout your life, there, there is the knowledge that this life is going to end one day. It is appointed once to man to die. And that cloud hovers over us all of our life. I'm going to die. One day my heart's going to quit beating and I'm going to lay down, and this old body is just going to give out. I'm going to die. And we live with that every day of our life. And God says one of these days at the banquet table, I'm going to take that shroud off of you, and you will never have to live with the fact that you will ever die again. Now notice, <laughs> he says, the shroud that envelops and folds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. What's the sheet? Well, the shroud is the knowledge that we're going to die. The sheet is the grief and the pain that death has created in the loss of our loved ones. He says you'll never have to deal with grief ever again. Gets gooder. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace. Well, what, what is that disgrace? I want to tell you what it is. It's the shame and the reproach that God's people have received at the hands of somebody else who has belittled them because of their faith who has shamed them because of their walk with God, who has spoken down to them, who has come out against them because, let me just tell you, friend, there's coming a time when we won't have to live with those that are belittling our relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, I'm gonna take all of that away from you. The Lord has spoken in that day. They will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And then when that day comes, I'm just telling you, let the eternal party get started. God has taken death, hell, the grave, separation, grief will all be gone. And he says, sit here at my table. I got the best meat I got the best cheese, the best food you've ever put in your mouth, and I just want to hang out with you for eternity. Have you ever met Jesus? How many of you met Jesus? 
You know him as your Lord and as your Savior. You have the assurance that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. Can you go back to a place and a moment in time when you realized that you were a sinner in need of a Savior and you turned away from sin and placed your faith and your trust in him and your life has never been the same since? Do you have a testimony like that? If you have it, you need one. It can be today right here in this place. Some of you are going through the battles right now. Battle for your job, battle for your home, battle for your health, battle for your finances. All hell has come against you. God says, come over here a minute. Let me just, let me just take you out of that battle for a second. And I got this table set up here for you. Let you and I hang out a little while. And let me love on you. God says, I want to show the world the difference that I can make in somebody. I suspect some of you are here this morning. You're saved. You're on your way to heaven. But that old nature of yours is so powerful so strong it's done pulled you back over into some habits and some lifestyles that you turned your back against one day but that old nature's so strong God says come here you're in the battle but I've surrounded you I got a table over here for you that's me and you hang out so that you can get the strength because without me you can't do anything. Some of you need to come this morning and just say, you know what, God, I just want to thank you for loving me. Yeah, I, I go through battles, I go through struggles, I go through heartaches, I find difficulties every day, but, but God, I just want to say thank you for loving on me. Some of you need to come and say, you know what, God, I'm not blessable, but I want you to bless me. I, I'm not blessable, help me to become blessable. Turn away from sin. You say, preacher, I don't know some of the stuff you're talking about. Some of this stuff doesn't make sense to me. Well, why don't you just come tell God about it? God, I don't understand what that preacher's doing. Is, but God, I realize that I'm a sinner. I know that. And God, I'm just going to put my faith and my trust in you today. I don't understand it all. I don't understand all about Calvary. I don't understand all of that death on the cross stuff. But God, I understand this, that you obviously love me. And I know that I need you. Just come tell God. Stand with me and let's pray. Please don't leave. Please don't leave. Just stand with me right now. Please don't leave. The invitation is the most sensitive moment of our services and it, it's so distracting to other people. It doesn't distract me, but it may distract somebody that may be deciding where they're going to spend eternity. Father God, I, I just want to thank you for your presence and power with us this morning. And Lord, it's obvious to me that you're at work in so many people's hearts and lives. And I pray that not one person would go out of this building this morning without knowing that they are in a right relationship with you. God, some of these hurting people, they need to be encouraged. Some of these people that are in the battles right now, God, they need to be at your table. I love you, Lord, and I I thank you for what you're going to do. God, thank you. Lord, do you come to me in my battles? Lord, you did this yesterday for me. God, you did it Thursday for me. In the midst of the battles, you came and, and Lord, we had fellowship together. And Lord, it helped me greatly, got me through. God, I pray that for these people here this morning. God, those that are in marital difficulties. God, those that are in substance abuse or God, those that may be in domestic violent home. Oh God, I pray you draw near to them right now, Lord Jesus. Draw 
near to all of us. Pull us aside right now out of the battles. Have your will and your way done in everybody's heart and life, I pray now. In Jesus' name, for his sake. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.